The title of this article is How the Internet Ruins Productivity by Design. And maybe it should be called How the Internet Ruins Your Capacity for Productivity by Design. Anyways, the age of mental peak performance. Peak performance is a term that's being used not only for athletes' physical performance, but for people just trying to get ahead at their workplace, and more so for those working on their entrepreneurial endeavors. With a lot of popular books like The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, people are becoming more aware of the fact that doing a 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. job for 40 years is a shitty deal. One way to get ahead is by using cognitive enhancers, known as smart drugs or nootropics. Nootropics are drugs, supplements, or other substances that improve cognitive function, particularly executive functions, memory, creativity, or motivation in healthy individuals. In the aggressively competitive world of Silicon Valley, nootropics are seen not just as a pick-me-up, but sometimes as a necessity. Tim Ferriss painted a good picture of the situation in his interview with CNN Money. Marathon. Let's just say you're a 24-year-old startup co-founder who just got a seed round of funding from a big venture capitalist, and you feel intense pressure to compete against the half a dozen other companies that are trying to do the same thing. You're going to think about what pills and potions you can take because of the difference between completely failing, losing all your money, making a million dollars, and making a billion dollars is right here. Like. Some Silicon Valley folk have gone as far as taking very small doses of lysergic acid diethylamide, better known as LSD or acid, to enhance their productivity and creativity at work. These microdoses of acid are having very profound effects on the user's output without any hallucinatory distractions. Now, most of us aren't at the level of seeking out illegal substances to amp up our game. For myself and a lot of people I know, it's not so much of, holy shit, I need to write 20,000 lines of code by tomorrow morning or I'm fucked, but something more like, okay, I woke up 45 minutes ago, I'm still in bed looking at Reddit, what the hell's wrong with me? There are some days where I wonder if I'm even hitting average performance, much less peak performance. The internet and our brains. It's being suspected that some people's inability to concentrate or lack of willpower is caused by the internet and the near constant stream of novel information they're accessing all the time. In Gary Wilson's TEDx talk, he explains that several studies about internet addiction and its detriments have been popping up since 2009. Gary says, so, so far, far all, brain all brain research points in only one direction. Constant novelty at a click can cause addiction. It wasn't until after I saw Gary's talk that I thought the way that I use the internet could be harming my productivity. Until recently, I was a recruitment consultant in Sunrise Land for three years. This is one of the most educational, exciting, and competitive times of my life. I met all kinds of fantastic people, but this environment really makes you start to evaluate yourself as a person based on how much you can output in as little as time as possible. I wanted to be at the top of the scoreboard, and sometimes I was five times as productive as I ever was in college, but sometimes I couldn't focus for more than 20 minutes. I was always looking for the magic pill or trick that could improve my performance, but I didn't know that how often I checked my Facebook feed could be affecting my performance in a bigger way than just the time I lost by opening up the app. Unsurprisingly, this addictive nature is actually designed into most apps. Nir Ale explains in his book Hooked how many websites, apps, platforms, etc. need to be designed in such a way that the product is addictive for the user or the company won't have a competitive edge. This technique to magnetize users to the content is called the hook. The hook is an experience designed to connect the user's problem to a company's solution with enough frequency to form a habit. The hook has four parts, a trigger, an action, a reward, and an investment. All the hooks start with an external trigger like click here, or swipe right, or an internal trigger. The internal triggers are what is critical to the user of forming the habit of using the company's service. Internal triggers are things that tell us what to do next, but where the information is not contained in the trigger, but instead informed through an association or a memory in the user's brain. So what we do when we're in a certain place, situation, around particular people, taking part in a routine, and most frequently when we experience certain emotions, dictates what we do next, the action that we turn to with little or no conscious thought. It turns out the most frequent internal triggers are these emotions, but not just any emotions. They are specifically negative emotions. So what do we do when we're feeling bored or lonesome or lost or fearful or uncertain or confused dictates the technology that we turn to next with little or no conscious thought. As I wrote out the previous paragraph, I experienced this firsthand. I couldn't quite think of how to phrase one sentence and I felt a slight sense of uneasiness as I struggled to think of what words to use. Right away, I opened a new tab and typed in reddit.com. 
This all happened in under two seconds without any deliberation. Actions are influenced by triggers, but what constitutes an action? Behavioral scientist B.J. Fogg describes an action as the simplest behavior in anticipation of a reward, which for me was a click on Reddit, but it could also be a swipe on Imgur or Imager, whatever you want to call it, or Tinder, or even a scroll on Facebook or Twitter. Pretty simple process then. A trigger, I feel bored, arises, so I take a simple action, open up Reddit, in anticipation of a reward, a funny image or video. When discussing human behavior, most of us have an inkling that the neurochemical dopamine influences our actions. This, for the most part, is correct. However, dopamine is widely misunderstood as a neurochemical that makes you feel good because you did something. Actually, as Stanford lecturer Robert Sapolsky explains, dopamine rises in anticipation of a reward. Dopamine doesn't go up after the reward, it goes up at this point. Not only does it rise in anticipation of a reward, but it spikes when you are uncertain of whether or not you will get the reward. Dr. Sapolsky talks about an experiment in which they had monkeys pull a lever in anticipation of a reward. When the situation went from, you will get a reward after every three pulls, to maybe you'll get a reward after every couple pulls, you see a massive spike in dopamine. As he put it, It does this. It's one of the biggest rises you will find in dopamine in the brain short of cocaine. This is very important because it means that a company's content doesn't even have to be good to get you to keep coming back. It just has to be designed in a manner that keeps us anticipating and searching for rewards. For example, take a look at the feed on Facebook. Is that cute girl from high school posing with a Starbucks cup that interesting? How about that picture of someone's lunch that comes next? Neither of those probably interest you. But how about that new tech article that your best friend posted that comes maybe four posts down the line? The feed is taking advantage of that spike in dopamine that we experience due to the anticipation of a possible reward. So we keep scrolling and scrolling, excited at the possibility that something good will pop up. It's addictive, but I'm not addicted. Addiction is thrown around in context like, oh gosh, this is so addicting, all the time. However, hearing someone say, I need to get treatment for my addiction, has a completely different nuance. Using it that way would suggest that the addiction is affecting their lives and needs to be fixed. Why people turn to drugs despite the social and legal repercussions is complicated, but it can boil down to the fact that the users aren't satisfied with their lives. It may even be that they're not satisfied with the current year, the current month, or even the current moment that they're experiencing. People pursue success in business, fitness, or relationships mainly because they are anticipating some sort of reward, usually a good feeling that comes with achievement. But why work towards these types of fulfillment for so long when you can invest a couple of seconds snorting cocaine or just taking a pill? Surely a terrible mindset, but not completely different from getting the rewarding delicious flavor of a donut immediately, rather than chasing the great feeling of women complimenting your hard-earned six-pack or even swiping through a couple profiles on Tinder to feel excited when you see a sexy girl versus investing a couple more minutes to read a chapter of that book that you like. When you look at it like this, the idea of not just substances but behaviors being addicted is more plausible. How are we to notice that the internet could be affecting us? I mean, I've had high-speed internet ever since I was in high school. David Foster Wallace told a joke at his commencement speech for Kenyon College class of 2005 that went like this. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? Gary Wilson also mentions this fish situation in his talk to show how hard it is to realize that the internet is affecting heavy users. He explained how the only symptoms that did cause internet porn loving men to realize it was having an effect on them was erectile dysfunction. Young men are being diagnosed with and medicated for ADHD, social anxiety disorder, and depression due to symptoms like less interest in day-to-day -day activities, lower ability to concentrate, and eroded willpower. They're going to psychologists and psychiatrists to treat these symptoms, but don't realize it could be alleviated by simply changing their behavior. One study in China shows how internet addicts have impaired executive function controllability. Having an impaired attention control, inhibitory control, and ability to select and successfully monitor behaviors that facilitate the attainment of chosen goals would definitely explain my unfinished to-do lists. If you have enough willpower to right away stop continuously swiping, scrolling, and clicking, then great. But for myself and a lot of people, it's not so simple to get out of the habit. 
The idea is not to immediately stop using all of these platforms, but to pull yourself out of the hook inherent in their design. There's nothing wrong with taking a 10 minute break from work when you need to and doing something that you enjoy. When you're unconsciously spending more time than you intend to, then there's an issue. Getting out of the hook. The good news is that understanding how your brain is being manipulated by this hook was a first step towards avoiding it. In his TED Med talk, Judson Brewer describes a two-part technique that several smokers have used to successfully kick their smoking habit. The idea is for our participants to just be mindful about smoking. What? Yeah, we said go ahead and smoke. Just be really curious about what it's like when you do. And what did they notice? Well, here's an example from one of our smokers. She said, mindful smoking smells like stinky cheese and tastes like chemicals. What she discovered just by being curiously aware when she smoked was that smoking tastes like shit. She started to become disenchanted with her behavior. The other part of the technique was to be mindful about what the craving felt like when it came up. They'd crave a cigarette and then notice their body was a little tense, heart rate maybe sped up a little bit, and some noticed they were fidgeting in their chair. By simply being mindful about these aspects, subjects were able to step out of their craving and realize exactly what it was and let it pass. Next time you feel the urge to check Twitter, take a moment to think why you're doing that. Maybe you're a little bored or frustrated with the task at hand. Maybe you're hungry, so your concentration has waned. Then think about the experience of Twitter itself, scrolling through that feed for more than five minutes. Is it really engaging you in a fulfilling way? Are you really happy that you're 10 minutes in and still spending your time scrolling through all those tweets, hoping a good one will pop up? It will take a bit of time and practice, but you'll quickly learn to catch yourself and reel yourself back in. Or you could always try Louis C.K.'s method. Yeah, like I've been more deliberate about my life. Uh, for instance, I'm not on the internet anymore. I, like I quit the internet. I gave my daughter my phone and I said, make a restriction code and lock me out of the internet. We should end it there. We should yeah. just fade to black. Yeah. <laughs> uh. If you like this, make sure to subscribe for more videos to come.